Hello everyone and welcome to our Tech Tuesday Tutorials number 174. Today we look at some educator prompt suggestions for the increasingly popular ChatGPT. So unless you've been living under a rock lately, you've heard of ChatGPT. If you haven't, then well... Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. ChatGPT is an AI-powered chatbot that basically knows everything and can write almost anything for you. It's like your own personal Jarvis. It's like talking to the internet. You can access it at chat.openai.com and if they're not slammed or too busy, uh, you can use it for free. If you pay $20 a month though, you can have unlimited access and you can access ChatGPT4, which is their latest model. It's much smarter than the free one, GPT-3. So, what can you ask it to do? Well, that's the rub. The real magic of this AI is in the prompts that you provide for it. So, I thought I'd share a few prompts that educators might find useful. This is absolutely not an exhaustive list. There are websites and articles and videos on this already, but I thought I'd give my own little spin on it. So let's get right into it. Now, I've put together a small handout, which I will link in the description with some of the information that I'm providing in this video. And there's a few things you want to consider when using this chatbot. The first is tone. You can ask ChatGPT for creative or fun or engaging, professional, funny, witty answers to your questions or to what you're having it create. So keep that in mind. Anytime you're giving any of these prompts, you can then add in qualifiers for the tone. You can also specify context, like who's this for? Is this a handout for students? Is this a handout for colleagues or professionals? Is this a letter to your AP? Also, be specific. Now, we're not used to this as much with Google because when we do Google searches, if we're specific about something like explain like I'm five or something like that, it puts that into the search terms itself. Well, no, ChatGPT is smart enough to parse out what you're saying and receive instructions and differentiate the instructions you're giving it and the parameters you're giving it from the actual request you're giving it. It's kind of crazy, but you can actually be very specific and put all sorts of restrictions upon what you want it to do. And the, the fourth one that I want to say is, and this is something people forget, you're having a conversation with this bot. So remember that it, it's not just a Q&A thing. You don't just ask it a question that spits out an answer. You can then go back and say, ah, revise that, but shorter, use less uh, complex words, or uh, make that a little bit lighter in tone or something like that. So let's, let's look at some specific prompts. Uh, the first one I wanted to do was uh, make GPT behave as a historical figure. So I could come in here, select the model. I'm going to use GPT-4 and I'm going to just paste in this prompt here. Assume the role of a historical character, Abraham Lincoln. Of course, you put in your own. You are to stick to your character during this chat whenever I use text in quotation marks. Example, how long did it take for you to deliver an address at Gettysburg? If I do not use quotation marks, I'm speaking to chat GPT, not your character. Keep your knowledge to only that which your character would know in life. Be consistent. Don't look into this world's future or provide character with knowledge that he or she would not know. Whenever responding as your character, use the following format. Look at all the restrictions and the specificity I put into this uh, prompt. And let's see what it says. Understood. I'll assume the role of Abraham Lincoln when responding to text and quotation marks and stick to the character's knowledge and so on. So let's start with our first question for it. Right. What do you think of General McClellan? And I put that in quotation marks as, I, as I'm sticking to my own rules. And of course, it then answers as Abraham Lincoln that he's a capable commander and so on. But you're going to see that he's going to have some criticism for him. I could ask it questions that are not necessarily Googleable. Um, these aren't necessarily strictly factual, right? Like, what do you think of so-and-so? Well, okay, maybe so. I, given today's political climate, what do you think is our nation's biggest threat? That's a, that's a much bigger, broader essential question almost. And you'll see it starts answering. Now, if you're using ChatGPT3, it's way faster, but it's a lot less accurate and a lot less um, creative. And I think the GPT4 is just way smarter than GPT3. So whenever I have the time, I try to use GPT4. One thing I would like to point out here is that it obeyed my restrictions of restricting his answer to only what he knew in time. So I could actually 
go in here and relieve it of, of its restrictions and say, for the next question only, I want you to use modern knowledge and break character. Now answer this question again, given today's political climate. And it might then be able to look at how things are going on today. And that would be an interesting perspective on how Lincoln would look at today's situation. Of course, it's all fictional. Of course, it's all hypothetical. So another thing might be, let's see, let's say I wanted a concise introduction to a book. I said, I need to introduce the book 1984 to my students. Help me with a good introduction to the book to be said to the class in person at the beginning of a week long exploration into the book. Again, not just give me a quick overview of 1984, specifically and restrictively, this is my audience. This is the context. This is what I need. And you'll see it says, good morning, afternoon, dear students. Today we embark on an exciting journey and so on. And it goes into this. And then finally, you know, it says, as we read and analyze this, remember that the work is not just a cautionary tale, a call to action. And so dear students, let's embark on this. If this is too long, I could say revise that, shorten that a little bit, make it a bit more exciting. Sure, I don't know, and I, I'm just doing this on the fly, but you can see, get ready to dive into a thrilling world of George Orwell's classic dystopian novel. Uh, today we embark on an exciting novel. So there, it's already changing the word, the verbiage, and so on. I could then say, I need a hundred words or less, or something like that. Again, it's that back and forth you're doing with this AI. So another option here, let's say that you're new to teaching a topic. And this happens all the time with teachers. You know, they're really good at this one particular aspect of their subject. And then this year, they're the only one who's doing American Lit. And they are rusty on it, haven't done it in a while. Or maybe they're fairly a new teacher and they've never taught it. And so they might say, what are some fun ways to introduce a certain topic or grade level or describe a certain topic in detail? So in this case, I had one that I said, I have to do a lesson on this standard. I pasted the standard straight from Georgia standard, but it's my first time teaching this to high school students. I would like a good intro hook, activity, article, or exercise to get them interested. Can you provide some suggestions? Something 20 minutes or less. Again, these restrictions. Intro hook. You can begin the lesson by showing a short video clip from a movie or documentary. Uh, this will pique the interest. And then an activity. Economic freedom simulation. Divide the class into two groups, high economic freedom and low economic freedom. Provide each group with a set of materials to create a small businesses, smart supplies, crafts, or whatever, simple snacks, and then explain the rules. High economic freedom group, they can trade freely, choose their own products, and so on, and low economic freedom, they have to follow strict regulations, fixed prices, so on. Give each group 10 minutes, and then debrief them. Or, here's an article on this, and so on. So I said, can you provide a link or two for exercise step three? The exercise step three is, after they've completed their rankings, reveal the actual rankings according to a reputable source, such as the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom or the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom of the World Report. Well, its knowledge cutoff date is September 2021. I could provide it links, but in this case, it says, look, I'll just give you the URL to the main pages. And I tested them. And sure enough, when I go to that, there's the World Index of Economic Freedom. And I can see what's ranking. Notice that the U.S. is not there. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and then go back. And so I've got these nice links for that. That's awesome, right? I mean, I didn't know exactly where to go. I guess I could have Googled that and all, but it's just, uh, why not just ask? And then I said, can you elaborate on the economic freedom simulation activity? Specifically, the simple snack option sounds fun. Well, it knew what I was talking about. It went, did that. And then it starts expanding it. Here are the materials you need. You need crackers, sliced cheese. I could even say, ah, we don't want to do ham and cheese. Let's do candy instead. And it would revise this. Th th this ability to reference previous content and again, keep going back and forth with this thing is huge. I could say, uh, create a quick uh, homework assignment to review the materials in this lesson. And so here's a homework assignment that it's going to do because this is assuming they've been through this lesson today. And then a reflection and analysis of the materials covered in today's lesson. And here's the reflection with instructions on what they should do. And if I needed to, I could then say provide a student work sample of that. And it's going to go in there and write a one to two paragraph paper on this uh, and then give you know two to three paragraph analysis. And I could even tell it write a, a paper that would be equivalent to a C on the on the assignment. Like this is ridiculous, right? It's just something you can do as a teacher if you want to be using ChatGPT uh, over the summer. Okay, let's move on because I could I could do this all day. If you're if you're new to something and you don't know much about something, I'm like as a teacher, right? 
I'm new to the concept of restorative practices in the classroom. Can you give me a quick rundown? And I'll be dang, it just goes in there and tells me the five basic principles of restorative practices, including building relationships, restorative conversations, community building, and so on. And okay, what are the major lessons or concepts a teacher should know about the book Understanding by Design? Sure, it knows the book, it, it knows who wrote it, it knows all of that, and says here are some of the five major things, takeaways from that book that a teacher should know. Crazy, I've read the book, it, it's spot on about this. Um, I'm a teacher and I've heard the term essential question used in some professional development. Can you teach me about this? Sure. Short enough for you to read in a fairly small amount of time and explains very well what essential questions are and why they're not just basically unit questions, why they're not just basically content questions. I think a lot of folks out there need to review this. But this is the kind of stuff that as a teacher, you might be like, I missed a PD on this. I need a really quick rundown. Or you might say, what should teachers do to prepare for AI and its impact in schools for the upcoming school year? And then here it is. Familiarize yourself with the AI. Stay up to date on AI trends in education. Evaluate some AI tools. Develop digital skills. Embrace the blended learning approach, which is going to be a big deal. Promote digital literacy. Collaborate with colleagues and experts. We need to be doing this over the summer. We absolutely need to be. Advocate for support and resources. Reflect on teaching practices. This probably should be number one. And then be open to change. Yeah, the times there are changing and you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. Or so Bob Dylan said. This is all really solid advice. One thing I found interesting here was um, I said write a, a lesson plan for this standard. And make it a three-day lesson, but only detail one day and give me a brief overview of days two and three. So there's the standard eighth grade. It, it interpreted it and knew that we were talking about eighth grade. Durations three day, day one, objective, materials, instructional stuff. There's a handout that mentions causes of the Civil War, and I didn't see anything there. So I had it. I just said, generate the handout for day one, introduction. Handout, causes of the Civil War, introduction there are the causes of the civil war and then the conclusion okay generate a quiz for day one done multiple choice of course with an answer key okay revise it with two short answer and two true false again that conversation done provide a reflection assignment and a rubric to grade the reflection so reflection after learning about the causes take a moment to reflect on what you learned write a one paragraph a reflection that addresses the following questions which of the causes do you think was the most significant and why? How do you think the issue of slavery impacted the relationship between North and South? And do you think the Compromise of 1850 was a successful attempt to address the issue of slavery? Why or why not? Guys, this is not just simple factual answers here, right? This is higher order thinking too, that it created. And then the rubric, here's the rubric for it, for their reflection assignment. And a total of 12 points, but can be adjusted to fit the needs. I said, display that rubric in a table, please. Done. Not a problem. Speaking of rubrics, I wanted a better rubric for something. And I said, create a rubric for a high school English class for a persuasive essay assignment, five indicator levels, five to seven performance criteria, zero to four points in each in a table. And it follows it perfectly. I could then revise it. I don't like your counter arguments or rebuttal one. Redo it. So on. Redo it with this in mind. So on. I needed a student writing sample just so that I could copy paste and use as an example for something or maybe for an assignment. Provide a fifth grade writing sample for the question, what did you do this summer? And it did so easily. So then maybe I say, um, revise that um, as if it would score uh, a C on the assignment. Maybe, I don't know, I'm guessing here. And it goes here. Um, and it's so much different in terms of tone. This summer I did some things with my family. We went camping, visited amusement park, saw my grandparents, right? Very different in tone and quality and so on of the writing. Um, you could ha you could have it you know, insert deliberate mistakes or something like that, grammatical errors or whatever. It's really about just what you can conceive of it doing for you. I had an example, write an email to Mr. and Mrs. Doe about their daughter, Jane Doe, excelling in my AP history class with a 98 average. Again, specific. She's helpful and kind student that makes the class more enjoyable for everyone. However, note that she's missing an essay, which is unusual. Keep the tone friendly, upbeat, but professional. Create an appropriate subject line. I mean, this took me much less time to write than this would. And then I can go back and revise it and look at it.
I know time is a thing for teachers. And a lot of times your job performance isn't really tied to your ability to write the seventh email to mom and dad that day. It's tied to your ability to teach. So is this an appropriate use of AI? Absolutely. Especially if you're, more importantly, if you're revising it or looking at it to see if it's exactly what you want to say, because this is these are now your words and you better be, um, you're going to be held accountable to them. So I even went meta with this and I said, give me 10 good chat GPT prompts for K-12 teachers. So <laughs> the AI is telling you how best to, inter to interact with the AI. Isn't that, I mean, that's, that's a little weird, right? But it's true. And these are actually pretty good. Like, what are some engaging creative ways to teach core subjects? Um, what are some classroom management strategies to create a positive and productive learning environment in my K-12 classroom? Now, I wasn't very specific. I might say, give me 10 good chat GPT prompts for K for middle school art teachers or for high school English teachers or all sorts of stuff or for uh, teacher productivity. Um, and not concerned about the classroom environment and teaching. I'm talking about my life as a teacher. Again, I have a lot in here. I'm going to put them all in here. I'm going to link to this document and you can try these out as you wish. For the most part, I tried to highlight areas that, you know, that you would insert your own kind of content there. Um, and some of them I got from a website that had like 50 good ideas and there were some really good ones there. So I linked to the source on that and you can go take a look at that. Yeah, one to hear that I thought was pretty good was you know, make a handout explaining this concept, but made for this level of students and keep it to one page or write the text for a PowerPoint slideshow on this topic. And I'll just highlight that. Keep the words as concise as possible. Use bullet points, right? Write an apology letter to my administrator about blank. In this case, forgetting to close the side door next to Mr. Jones's room. Explain it's not going to happen again. This is the one I just showed you here. Or please review a sample of my writing for me for tone, clarity, or style. Rewrite it, but indicate the changes you made. Let me know when you're ready to accept my writing sample. And then it will then say, okay, I'm ready. And then you paste your writing sample. Create an agenda for a meeting with my high school math PLC about the new Georgia standards. Uh, or shorten the following text to so many words. There are hundreds and hundreds of ways that teachers can be using ChatGPT in their professional capacity. We're not even talking about students using it yet. We're just talking about you, especially as we go into the summer. This is something you should be getting on. Again, you just go to chat.openai.com. And when you get there, you'll need to create an account. It's free, but if you pay $20 a month, you have unlimited access to version four, which trades that speed for much better reasoning and much better conciseness. So I hope you all enjoyed this video and I hope you found it useful. And if you did, go ahead and click that like button. Heck, why not support us and click that subscribe button. Click on the bell icon to receive email notifications. Leave a comment or an idea for a Tech Tuesday video below. Share this video with your friends. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.